we're going to finish off the morning with an awesome talk by Dr. Doug Van Fossen regarding STEMIs. Dr. Van Fossen is the director of the cath lab at Dublin Methodist Hospital and uh, one of my favorite cardiologists to call up in the middle of the night for help in the emergency department. Dr. Van Fossen, thank you uh, for being here this morning and it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, and I'll thank you all for uh, sticking around this long to uh, take a listen here. Uh, obviously, I have a little technical difficulties with my electronics. Uh, however, it, as I said, I feel much more comfortable in the cardiac catheterization laboratory. What I'm going to talk about is just uh, the introduction to STEMI, first of all, here at the Dublin Hospital, uh, but number two, just in general management, how the uh, how the management of patients with acute myocardial infarctions has changed uh, over the last uh, 20 to 30 years, most of it occurring uh, uh, from about 2005 forward. Uh, so with that, we'll sneak on to the next slide, won't we? Okay, there we go. Uh, I thought I'd give you some background on this. Uh, just to, to give you a, a feel for what's out there uh, and, and what the organ we're dealing with is, is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. If you take into account that the average heart rate is about 72 beats a minute and there are 1,440 beats or minutes in a day, that gives us roughly about 104,000 beats per day that that heart's clicking along. It's pretty efficient. It puts out about 7,260 liters of blood a day. And interestingly, because the kidneys take about 20% of the blood flow, it's filtered about 290 times a day. If the average individual carries around about five liters of blood volume, the blood is actually recycled about 1,400 times a day. Uh, I think we can adver advertise ourselves as the ultimate Green New Deal in terms of recycling. Um, roughly 5% of the output that the heart shoves out there comes back to its own purposes uh, for maintenance of coronary blood flow and, and the activities of the uh, myocardium. Hey, doc, oh, yeah, Dr. Van Fossen, you might be a little bit behind on your slides. We're, we're seeing the points that you're bringing up now. Oh, okay, so you, you're just now seeing that? Yes. Okay. Uh, I can run through those again. Average heart rate, average heart rate is 72 beats a minute. Uh, roughly, uh, well, actually 1,440 minutes in a day. Uh, this gives us around 104,000 beats per day, delivering about 7,260 liters of blood per day. Uh, as the kidneys receive about 20% of the blood flow, it's filtered 290 times a day. Uh, the average blood volume being about five liters, uh, the blood is recycled roughly 1,400 times a day. And as I said before, that's the ultimate Green New Deal with uh, the recycling aspect of it probably exceeding most other recycling activities that exist. About 5% of the cardiac output constitutes coronary blood flow. Do we have the uh, slide to the next level? Vascular highways? Yes, you're good, sir. All right. Uh, if you look at the human body, there is roughly 60,000 miles of conduit out there. Uh, that's enough to cir encircle the globe about twice at the equator. Uh, so there's a lot of highway for us to manipulate. Interestingly, from a cardiovascular perspective, we actually focus on about 40 to 50 centimeters. That's the distance from your elbow to your fingertips. Uh, so not a lot of uh, uh, tubing that we're going to mess with. And I made a little uh, uh, an example here to the right side. You see something most people are familiar with, which is the uh, charging cable for an iPhone or an iPad or some other Apple device. Uh, it's about an eighth of an inch thick. And that is about the size of most vessels that we work on in the cardiovascular system. Uh, at least within the heart. Uh, brains are actually a little bit smaller, but cardiovascular vessels are on the order of an eighth of an inch to a tenth of an inch in size. So these are relatively small tubes that we're working with. Now, what we have to look at is when things go south. <clears throat> Roughly, 
660,000 people die from cardiovascular events each year. 4.6% of adults carry a diagnosis of CAD. So if there are 100 people in your room, there's five of them that have are card carrying coronary disease patients. The ER entertains roughly 7.2% of uh, their clients uh, as a consequence of cardiac and or chest pain uh, activities or elements that are related to the cardiovascular system. A new infarct occurs about every 40 seconds. Uh, so that's going to keep the squads pretty busy in the states. There are 805,000 myocardial infarctions each year. And the problem is that 650,000 of those are new. These are people who are going about their own business without really any awareness that the cardiovascular system is getting ready to fall off the edge. And they have symptoms which are strange to them, but not necessarily uh, uh, having been felt before or uh, uh, in many respects, very unfamiliar. Uh, and we kind of wonder why it takes them so long to figure out the fact that it's their heart attacking them and to come into the system and something we'll discuss later. As a consequence, there are about 2,400 cardiovascular deaths each day. So it takes a pretty good toll on our, our population. Now, what I've shown here is one of the classic EKGs of an acute anterior myocardial infarction. Uh, it has the ST segments lifted in V1, V2, V3, V4, and sometimes out to V5, as well as some AVL and lead one. Uh, these would be this would be the representative pattern of the lead system detecting abnormalities on the anterior wall, and most typically this occurs with a an occlusive event involving the left anterior descending coronary, or one of its tributaries. And this might be the pathologic specimen of somebody who didn't quite survive the event. Uh, this is a look at the heart from above, looking down toward the apex of the heart, and this uh, area of involvement is along the interventricular septum. You can see the blanching and the purplish discoloration where the myocardial infarction occurred, and is likely on this individual because the extent of myocardium that was involved was not a large amount, probably precipitated a significant arrhythmia resulting in their demise. On the other hand, the inferior events typically tip up the ST segments of the inferior leads, which are classically 2, 3, and AVF. We may see reciprocal changes in the anterior, anterior lateral, or lateral leads in these particular patients, depending upon whether it's the circumflex distribution or for the right or a patient with interior right ventricular involvement, and it may be the right ventricle that is actually driving most of the hemodynamics of their unsettled state. And this would be a representative pathologic specimen from an individual who did not survive an inferior event. You can see the changes from approximately 4.30 or so around to 7 o'clock in this particular uh, pathologic specimen showing the infarct involving a right coronary artery. This is how we used to treat them. Think back to the 60s and 70s. Patient, oops, doesn't look like my slides will move through like they're supposed to. Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, we had, uh, if you recall, you drive by hospitals. Who did that? And you'd see signs outside that say quiet hospital zone. Patients were placed into rooms. The rooms were darkened and quieted, and they were allowed to have their ischemic event. As we got into the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we started becoming more aggressive with these individuals with the use of IV nitrates, heparin, the development of ICUs, mobile squads, and finally, in the mid-80s to early 90s, we started bringing these patients urgently to the cardiac catheterization laboratory, where we identified the occlusive event and set about uh, restoring blood flow. This slide, again, these are supposed to be gross slides, but they don't seem to be growing. So I will start with the central slide, central portion here, which shows the D2B alliance 
which was the first effort to try and, and organize efforts to manage patients with acute ischemic events. If you look at the date on this initiation was November 2006. If we go up to the top left-hand corner, an analysis at 2008 showed us that now door to balloon times were less than 90 minutes and over 75% of patients presenting. Migrating to the top right, by 2010, 91% had seen a door to balloon time of less than 90 minutes. And this was compared to pre D to B Alliance, door to balloon Alliance, when only 44% of patients were successfully brought to the laboratories and the vessel intervened upon within 90 minutes. So there was a tremendous amount of progress made over that five years time. And if you look at this, we're talking about nationwide. This is a process that really brought about all sectors of the management scheme and was able to coordinate them and bring about a much more rapid management of these patients. I will say that this was predominantly the, the door of the facility. And, and we'll, we'll get on to why this is important later on. But the door to balloon times originally uh, were from the time that patient hit the door of the hospital until the vessel was uh, treated and uh, restored, a restoration of flow occurred. Down in the lower right hand corner, by, Jan, uh, by September 2010, we had over 70% of patients having that door to balloon time less than 75 minutes. So we're notching down from a 15 minute reduction in overall time uh, over that course of uh, a five or that five year span. So some tremendous progress was made in, in the approach to these. So what is it we're dealing with? We're looking at progression of atherosclerosis in these patients. And the, the typical model is one of, uh, as we progress from left to right on this particular cartoon, is an otherwise normal looking segment of uh, blood vessel. And as lipids start to accumulate and injury accumulates in the vessel, there's first an eccentric remodeling. Uh, Mother Nature does some tremendous work trying to maintain a vessel lumen to provide blood flow to the distal organs. However, uh, there is some elastic point that this process is no longer able to compensate for the amount of atheroma and uh, extracellular matrix that occurs. And we start encroaching upon the lumen, creating that luminal abnormality that we typically see in a cardiac catheterization and define as a stenotic segment. The problem with angiography is it misses what's actually going on within the vessel wall, that there's a lot of activity and a lot of plaque burden that has occurred before we actually see an encroachment on the lumen uh, that would show up as a stenosis on the angiogram. The other thing that would become evident is that lesions that are most likely to create myocardial infarctions are on the 40 to 60% stenotic range. These patients uh, uh, typically are without true angina. 40 to 60% stenosis is not sufficient enough to cause an embarrassment of flow and typically will not occur on a standard stress test. And it is those 40 to 60% lesions that have a significant amount of plaque migration, plaque movement, plaque changeover that makes them particularly susceptible to rupture, which brings about the terminal event of coagulation and occlusion. 70 80 and 90% lesions are typically angina producing lesions. They typically tend to be a bit more stable as well. So the fallacy of the stress test is that it does not have the capability of predicting when a patient is likely to have an infarct. And there's probably a lot that's gone around on the grapevine about, well, Bob just had a stress test that was negative and he died of a heart attack. This is why, because we really have not yet developed the test or the evaluation that permits us to predict when these 40% stenoses are likely to rupture. Here's what the timeline means. We do have that window of opportunity, which has been driving us to the faster uh, interventions. If you look at uh, what's taking place, we have at the very bottom, the breakdown in times from, what, who's doing that? The breakdown in time, we're at 30 minutes to five, a half an hour to four hours, four hours to six hours, and up to 12 hours 
we have opportunity. Uh, we have uh, reversible, potentially viable myocardium that's intermixed with a certain degree of necrosis that if we're able to restore blood flow and provide uh, a healing opportunity as well as the nutrition and oxygen that myocardium needs, we've got an opportunity for salvaging myocardium and in the long game, the thing that makes the most important predictor on longevity uh, and mortality is going to be the preservation of left ventricular function. So for every degree of myocardial cells and segment that we can salvage, it actually uh, turns into a much better prognosis for that particular patient. Once we get out beyond 12 hours, however, in the absence of ongoing hemodynamic disturbances, electrical or rhythmic disturbances or ongoing significant chest pain, it's actually detrimental to reopen that vessel. Uh, in that phase, you take an already infarcted and damaged uh, distribution of myocardium and turn it into liquefaction and you increase the risk of rupture and disruption of uh, uh, different elements of the myocardial substrate by reperfusing at this latest stage. This is the EKG evolution in this process. If we look very early on, and hopefully you can see that it's a little bit small on the screen, but the initial EKG is a normal QRS with ST segment. With the initial occlusion, we have hyperacute T waves. You can see peaking of the T waves, and this is something that may show up on the monitor at the squads arriving at the house with elevated T waves, but not truly an ST segment elevation. Later, after 30 to 40 minutes time, we start to see lifting of the ST segments. As we evolve and develop the Q wave, which is either the loss of the R wave or a deepening of the, of the precordial Q waves, that is signifying to us that we've developed myocardial injury and cell death. Later on at 12 hours, there is a return to the baseline of the QR, I'm sorry, the ST segment, an inversion of the T wave, and as we move out several weeks, we start to see a more normalized pattern of the ST segments and T waves, but now we have the residual Q wave in that patient. Patients who have a significant event with a large degree of myocardial damage may be left, however, with the ST segments persistently elevated into the T wave, and we would refer to this as more of an aneurysmal ST segment. On the other hand, if we're able to reperfuse these people early, we sort of condense some of the ST and T wave changes. We miss the extent of loss of the R wave and may actually prevent the Q wave. And there tends to be either a complete normalization of the ST segments and an otherwise normal looking electrocardiogram, or sometimes we have the deeply inverted T waves that you see in the final slide. So here's the curve that really matters. And this is what's driving most of those times that you will see out uh, uh, played out and and advertised and and uh, uh, beat about in all the societies that measure the quality of labs and and systems. Usually within the thir first thirty minutes, there's not a large amount of myocardial damage that occurs. There's some resiliency there, and you're able to get by with that first thirty minutes or so. Uh, and get pretty good salvage if that vessel flow is restored. However, over the next 90 minutes to uh, uh, two hours, we start to see a rapid decline in the amount of myocardium that has been salvaged. And as a consequence, the mortality actually increases. As we get out to 12 hours, we really have raised a flattened portion of the curve. And from the onset of symptoms, we really have little salvage occurring at those points in time. And usually intervention is limited to patients who have ongoing uh, issues with hemodynamic instability, uh, recurrent dysrhythmias, or recurrent chest pain, because we may not, in fact, be dealing with a complete occlusion in that individual. But there are some variables. Uh, if we go back to the other curve, which I, I will in the next slide, not all parts are going to respond equally with an occlusive event. Uh, if there's preconditioning, the myocardium has a certain degree of preparing itself for the winter storm. If you have intermittent events that are partially occlusive, meaning that the vessel flow has been stagnated for a period of time, restored, stagnated, restored, 
which may occur when the natural body lytic system comes into play, the myocardium starts to recognize that the situation is not that good. And as a consequence, like most it, uh, organs or individuals or uh, other types of beings, it's going to preserve self first. Remember that if we look at the heart as a global organ uh, with a primary uh, issue of uh, pumping blood, as we kind of alluded to in the very first slides of what's going on. However, the cell doesn't really look at it that way. Uh, the contractile apparatus is very energy consuming. It's unnecessary from the individual cell standpoint. The individual cell is interested in preserving the cell wall and the organelles that exist within it short of the contractile function. And it may go into what we typically refer to as a hibernating mode so that the cell is not contracting. And so on the surface, it looks like there's uh, significant myocardial damage. But in actual fact, the cell has switched over to preservation mode. The contractile apparatus has basically been shut down and the cell is working only on maintaining cell wall integrity and hence its survivability. This may occur with the preconditioning where we have repeated semi partially or non sustained occlusive events. The other issue that comes into play is when did the vessel actually occlude? Uh, was it a total occlusion instantly or was it a sputtering winking and blinking occlusion of the vessel? Uh, which now makes the timing of when the uh, process actually was initiated difficult and we start getting into problems of how how we really educate the adjudicate. I'm sorry, the uh, uh, door to balloon times if they have concurrent CAD, which may provide some element of collateralization where their chest pain occurred as they switched over from native flow to more dependency upon the collateral flow. And what is the microvasculature like? A patient with diabetes or hypertension may have a much poor microvascular bed that is really going to be uh, intolerant to any disruptions of flow. So the curve that we had shown before now takes on a little bit of uh, uh, question or a little bit of variability. What I've done here is highlight the area from left side, which would in its darkest form, which represent total occlusion to the right side, which would be a situation where there's not really total occlusion, but winking and blinking enough to create electrocardiographic abnormalities, but still maintaining a certain degree of myocardial perfusion. On the very left hand side may be the individual who wakes up at four o'clock in the morning with indigestion, attempts to ride it through during the course of the day, goes to work, looks like hell, his uh, work, uh, our coworkers say it's time that you know you need to go home. You look like hell. So he goes home, sits on the couch until his wife shows up and says, "You look like hell. We need to call the ambulance." And they end up bringing him into the hospital. He's got ST segments up, and he's treated as an acute infarct. When actually his infarct began at approximately four o'clock that morning, and we may be twelve to fourteen hours down the road. On the other hand, the individual who has a coronary artery that winks and blinks is not totally occlusive. Be much more susceptible because they're actually showing up before they've suffered a complete occlusive event. And those people, it's very difficult down the road to even identify that they've had an infarct, and they'd be more on the uh, grayer side of this curve. So it's a it's a problem we have with really uh, time stamping, as it were, the time of the acute ischemic event. Uh, we've had folks who have shown up in the laboratories with what appears to be within minutes of their initial symptoms, only to have the entire anterior wall kind of disappear and never recover. And we have other folks who have been sputtering for the last 12 to 14 or two to three days, and you reopen the vessel and their ventricle looks normal one to two weeks down the road. So it's, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot predicting who's going to get the best outcome. And part of that crapshoot is related to the fact that we have a very difficult time actually uh, time stamping the the acute process. So one of the things that's happened here in the Dublin area is that we're now uh, providing level two laboratory services. And uh, this was a very complex slide and I don't think we're going to get to re review the complexities of it. So I'll describe it for you. 
Level two labs were developed as a consequence of studies that were performed in 2000 to 2012 uh, called the C4 trial. That trial investigated whether or not it was safe to perform angioplasty in centers without on-site surgery. And one of the purposes for that was to be able to provide an extension of acute infarct management to areas outside surgical centers. Uh, why do we, would we do that? Surgical centers are very expensive. Uh, they require a large volume of patients to maintain competency because we're really doing some horrendous things to those patients when we uh, attempt to repair the coronaries by that methodology. And it's infrequently applied to STEMI patients. Uh, less than 0.6% of patients who present to laboratories with acute ischemic syndromes or acute myocardial infarctions go directly or in a very short time frame to the surgical lab. So with that premise in mind, the CPORT trial was undertaken, which randomized patients to sticking around at the uh, local hospital and having angioplasty or being referred to a surgical center and having their angioplasty. And then all comers with acute myocardial infarction were managed on site. They showed no difference. In fact, there was a little bit lower volume of complications seen in the remote sites. And as a consequence, we're now able to have effectively standalone laboratories within a reasonable hospital setting to perform angioplasty as well as management of the acute myocardial infarctions. Dublin received recognition uh, on October 11th, and so we're able to provide those services. Behind this tab is, is the fact that we also not only provide PCIs or angioplasty or shockwave therapy for calcified vessels, balloon pumps can be installed, and if necessary, impella devices can be installed, which will uh, enable uh, patients to be stabilized and then potentially transferred on to an extended uh, facility or higher level facility for management. Uh, level two laboratories will not manage long-term impella devices. The complexity is such that uh, the support staff is very difficult to train up and with very low volumes, they tend to be associated with higher complications than benefits. So this is what uh, ACC HA guidelines uh, projected as management. And I'm gonna really focus the, the, the bulk of the next several slides on this process. If you recall in the original days, the door to balloon time actually was the door of the hospital to inflation of the balloon, which was felt to represent the reestablishment of coronary vascular flow. And so what we had was activation of the EMS system with uh, either a patient calling in, a bystander noticing a problem, uh, or a family member calling, and a 911 activated the EMS. EMS arrives at the site, assesses, uh, obtains an EKG, determines uh, 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 enough of that abnormality exists to bring that patient on into the hospital. They are transported in, arrival at the hospital, uh, decisions are made, and a STEMI alert was typically called. If you look at this, that's a relatively inefficient process. It's serial, it's sequential, and it, it requires each step along the way to be completed before the next step is initiated. And as long as we were doing door to balloon and allowed the door to be the hospital door, that probably didn't make too much difference. It does make a difference when you're beyond the hours of eight o'clock to five o'clock. Uh, interestingly, when we went out to talk to one of the local squad houses about uh, the fact that we at, at the uh, Dublin Hospital would then be able to provide angioplasty and STEMI care, they were of the belief that this was only from 9 to 5. And as a cardiologist for 35 plus years uh, doing these interventions, I immediately signed up for that uh, offering. In actual fact, it's 24 by 7. Uh, you all know as well as I know that myocardial infarctions do not have uh, the courtesy of showing up between 8 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the afternoon when most activities are, are uh, up in full gear. And in a process of sequential management, valuable time's lost uh, between the squad coming in, the ER identifying and squad identifying that this is a myocardial infarction, and now we have to bring our staff in and current guidelines 
uh, in most all of the, the hospital settings require that those staff are able to arrive within 30 minutes. Uh, even in facilities that have on site uh, radiation techs and nurses, you're still dependent upon the clinicians showing up. And I'm not aware within the central Ohio area uh, of any of the cardiologists that are sleeping overnight in the hospital. So they are still uh, coming in via vehicle uh, to uh, uh, administer to these patients. So we go back to the original tent of the door to balloon was the patient's door actually. That is when the system really needs to be tuned to so that we're able to turn down the length of time that the myocardium remains ischemic. And we move that door from the hospital door back to the time when the EMS squad crosses that threshold. And so it broke down into something like this. The EMS was effectively allocated 30 minutes. The emergency room allocated 30 minutes to make an assessment and, and determine that there are other confounding issues or not. And then the cath lab had 30 minutes to either get in here or at least get the um, uh, patient uh, treated and the balloon uh, or stent across the culprit vessel. Uh, as long as this was sequentially processed, it put a lot of onus on transportation times and getting individuals there. Actually, what happens though, and, and this is the process that the alerts called uh, usually at the time of patient arrival. When you move to the patient's door to balloon, if the alert's called by the EMS, then what happens is the travel time is incorporated parallel to the travel time of the squads. It also shortens the amount of time that the ED needs to make their evaluation. I think if you ask any emergency room doc, they don't really need 30 minutes to make an assessment of these patients once they've been assessed and brought in by the squads. Uh, typically, it involves a certain degree of registration, a series of questions to make sure that there's no confounding issues present, uh, a series of questions about particular allergies, bleeding complications, trauma uh, that, that assist us when we start adding antiplatelets but they can condense the time in the emergency room quite substantially. So the minute the EMS has called the alert, the travel team starts their clock at the 30 minutes. They can arrive uh, either concurrently with the EMS squad or sometime during the early or initial evaluation in the emergency room. And that patient can be brought to the cath lab significantly sooner than otherwise uh, available or capable. Here's, here's the contemporary timeline in, in the blue box is showing us the ischemic savings time. And this is what we're pushing out to the squads as best we can. And I think it should be pushed out virtually in any system that the squads have full right to make the call. Uh, they're first on scene. They have an EKG and if it, their belief that the electrocardiogram and the clinical scenario is consistent with an ischemic slash STEMI event, then they should make the call. And when that call comes in to the ED, they should then alert the on-call team that a STEMI is on its way in and everybody gets their gears in motion. From our perspective, and I think from most perspectives nowadays, an EKG, although preferable, is not an absolute requirement. Uh, if the squad has difficulty transmitting, or the EKG system is not transmissible, uh, uh, or they're tied up with a patient who's unstable, simply the fact of saying that we've got a STEMI patient present and we're bringing him to your facilities is enough to light the system up and initiate the travel of the uh, cath lab team to get into the hospital. So our point on this is to say, if you have a STEMI, call it. Uh, don't hesitate. Don't be concerned about the fact that you may overcall when in fact uh, we did a study at one of our former institutions of the three cardiologists that have uh, that are now working at Dublin. We found that only 3% of our STEMIs called by the squad were overcalls, meaning that it was either a left bundle branch block that was not new or that it was hyper QT waves that were related to something else or that they once they came to the hospital, the ST segments were not elevated. That's probably a gross underutilization or under calling. 
nationally, the average is around 10% of calls that turn out to be not true STEMIs. And here's, here's the issue behind that. We, as folks driving into the system, can't make up time. Okay, we are we don't have the capacity uh, unless some of these new automobiles with electricity can kind of transport us uh, a little differently than the gas powered vehicles can. We really can't make up time. So if we get that call early, we are on the highway parallel with the EMS. And if it turns out that the ER doc sees the EKG puts a scenario together and says this is not a STEMI. You know, our cars will turn around quite well and we can end up back at home and be in bed in no time flat. Uh, and from our perspective, that's perfectly fine. There's nothing worse than trying to get in the hospital knowing you've got somebody potentially uh, uh, working their darndest to drop over dead. And you know that if by getting there in a timely fashion, you will be able to help intervene on that. Uh, if we've been notified while well, the squad's in transport, uh, we're still driving faster, but we have less of the uh, uh, intensity because we know we're likely to show up about the same time as the squad or shortly thereafter. So from our perspective, you can save us a lot of mental angst uh, by making that call and not to be worried about the times that the call is made and is not a true STEMI. So here's... Uh, and I'm going to be interested to see if this one will show up. This is that uh, anterior infarct that I showed you earlier. And this is the angiogram. So unfortunately, I don't think these are going to roll. No, they're not. Uh, on this particular patient, the left anterior descending coronary would be coming down the middle of the screen. And uh, our laboratory doesn't have these arrows attached to the patient's screens. We have to put them there ourselves. So we kind of have to know where these blockages are. But this is a left anterior descending, and right at the tip of that uh, vertical error, there is an absence of the LAD. Uh, this is occurring after the first septal perforator was probably likely going to result in a large anteroapical infarct, as manifest by that EKG, and brought into the laboratory. Uh, the vessel was reopened, and as you can see on the right hand screen, unfortunately, these are not. Mobile, are they? No, uh, I haven't figured out how to make the movies go on the WebExes. Uh, this would uh, go, it's uh, wind filled, it goes clear to the apex and shows a big wraparound left anterior descending coronary artery. And all the other vessels will, will fill in. There's there's nothing been lost in the equation. But the LAD now is again coming down to uh, five, six o'clock, uh, where it was uh, disappeared roughly at the center of the clock. Somebody's going to have to show me how to make videos on a web access. In this particular case, there was an inferior infarction, as we showed before with the pathologic specimen here, but we got a hold of the patient at this stage before this occurred. And hopefully we can show you that. Oh. Oh, we're not going to get either of them. Uh, these are vidiots that. Uh, uh, show, uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to show you. This was actually a very interesting case where the uh, uh, left main stem exists here, a large wraparound circumflex with this segment of circumflex being occluded right at this, subtotally occluded at this point. And you can see part of the wires that was drawn back, but there was a large vessel here recovered. And I'm not quite sure why we don't have that. So we'll just forget about it. So what are the other issues that occur? And uh, these are actually much more problematic, and we can discuss some infarction or cardiac arrest and, and in dealing with that uh, cardiac arrest. It's, it's a uh, not uncommon theme, and it does create its own set of problems. What are the predictors of success in a patient who is in full arrest? Time to EMS arrival left in eight minutes substantially affects prognosis. The presence or absence of bystander CPR, compression only, uh, uh, makes a major difference in survivability, both overall survivability as well as neurologic recovery in those individuals. 
Unfortunately, we're living in an age where people will get out their cell phones and take pictures before they'll bend over and perform CPR on a patient, and we've somehow got to get out of that equation. Early defibrillation has been shown to be beneficial. For every minute that patient remains in VTVF, regardless of the presence or absence of CPR, my mortality is increased by 10%. Available of AEDs will help because that obviously provides early defibrillation and can be administered by the lay person. And then if arrival to the hospital and the capability of performing uh, or reestablishing ROSC, therapeutic hypothermia has been shown to provide improved likelihood of neurologic recovery. The data on this is emerging uh, and it's the problem is, is we've got a large scope of patients that we're dealing with uh, in, in terms of the morbidity spectrum. Consideration of mer emergent catheterization has been the standard in STEMI and probably will continue to be the standard in patients in full arrest uh, if, in fact, we can document the ST segment elevation and certain other criteria are not met. Observational data, and I em emphasize observational data, support consideration of intervention in patients without ST segment elevation. As it turns out, in these circumstances, the door to balloon time falls off the map. It's a matter of making some assessments of uh, patient viability, certain laboratories to be drawn. Uh, it's a, not a 90 minute door to balloon phenomena for this population. It's a much more uh, gauged and, and uh, uh, evaluated process in that patient population. Part of that is the enthusiasm is tempered by the need to report outcomes. And this patient population generally has a very poor outcome. There's nothing more frustrating for the interventional cardiologist and the cath lab team to come in and take a patient who has been resuscitated uh, by the fantastic work of the squads and take them to the laboratory and identify an occluded vessel, open up the vessel, only to have palliative care being summoned 24 hours later and the patient taking off all life support uh, without what we would consider an opportunity for uh, progression. Uh, but that tends to be much more common than the, the one that gets out of the system. And here's what happens in those patients. They, they usually end up on a, a boatload of supportive care. Uh, if you look at it uh, from this perspective, this particular patient had ECMO placed. They had an interiority, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, a impella device to assist cardiac output. The ECMO was oxygenating the patient. It requires the uh, involvement of perfusionist, nephrologist, anesthesiologist, pharmacist, the whole gamut of people uh, to maintain this. And, and typically the survival's around 8 to 12 percent, somewhere, sometimes upwards of 40 percent. So in recognition of this particular problem, the ACC has come out with a, a simplified tool, as it were, for the management of these patients. And because projection of these tends to be a little bit uh, difficult, I put this together in a, another slide, which didn't grow like it's supposed to, but we'll tell the story. If you look at this particular slide, when do bad outcomes and futility cross over? Uh, We'll start with the top right hand corner. If you look at this, if you have two of the events on the left hand column, your survival is upwards of 40%. Uh, usually they are things that tend to be uh, 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 not cascading into other events. So let's say uh, ongoing CPR and no bystander CPR or greater than 30 minutes to ROSC. If you just have two of those events, then your likelihood of survival is upwards of 40%. If you have three or more, then your likelihood of survival is less than 40%. So three items out of this left-hand column will get you a survival already of less than 4%. And it's not uncommon for somebody who's had 30 minutes of uh, CPR to have a pH of 7.2 or less and a lactate greater than 7. Uh, and so they, they it now becomes a, a, a zone of futility. What determines almost absolute futility when we move them into a survival of less than 10%. And a survival less than 10% is almost universally predicted by non-VF rhythm upon arrival of the squad, greater than 30 minutes of ROSC, and age over 85. 
uh, let's face it, the 85 year olds just don't have a lot of room for uh, uh, changes in, in uh, the central hemodynamics. And when they fall off the curve, they fall pretty hard. On the other hand, the presence of all six of the ones on the left in blue, uh, there are seven there, but if you get six out of that seven, so what we've taken out is renal disease, non-cardiac etiologies, and unwitnessed, uh, I'm sorry, uh, ongoing CPR. If you have an unwitnessed arrest, non-ventricular fibrillation, no bystander CPR, greater than 30 minutes of ROSC, and pH or lactate up, then your chance of survival is less than 10%. And these folks as well really don't receive any significant benefit from trips to the cath lab. So if we have an arrest coming in with a uh, 85 years of age with over 30 minutes of ROSC in the first EKG obtained by the squad showed uh, uh, pulseless activity, uh, they're not going to make any headway in a laboratory and they're likely not going to be taken to the laboratory. On the other hand, if you have those uh, three or four criteria and the individual 70, 60, 50, 40, there's going to be a lot more leeway in taking that individual to the laboratory because they tend to be a little bit more resilient than that elderly individual. So we have survival in STEMI with or without shock really depends on a coordinated system effort. And I think the, the middle slides with the, with the blue, yellow, and green are kind of a uh, summary of that coordination. Um, we as a entity that operates within the hospital are heavily dependent upon a well-greased EMS team, uh, a squad that uh, identifies the patients with the acute myocardial infarction that transmits or alerts the system in a very timely fashion that allows us to move quickly uh, that then provides care in a very timely fashion. We can look at the newer technologies. Uh, they really have not made a major dent. It remains the door to balloon of less than 90 minutes is the gold standard for our survival. And finally, I think the last statement here is probably the best. It's highly likely that the simple application of bystander CPR and application of an AED may prove equally beneficial to survival at a fraction of the cost, as it were, uh, to uh, all the ECMO devices, the uh, balloon pumps and some of the wonderful uh, balloons and stents we have in terming survival of this patient population. So I think we're on the right track as we're moving forward. Uh, by Dublin becoming a level two lab, we've moved the tracks a little farther out and provided a new way station. And in my original talk, the A to Z, they actually represents A for activation and Z if the squads are stopping at Dublin rather than going all the way into Columbus, they will be in bed sooner as the round trip is substantially less. I'll open that up to questions. Dr. Van Fossen, that was excellent. Thank you. Um, we had a few questions that came through uh, and I'll relay them on to you. The first is, um, you know, there, there are, um, there's some talk in the emergency medicine world and the EMS world about um, pseudo STEMIs, things like um, the Winters T waves or Wellen syndrome or the a AVR syndrome with diffuse ST elevation. Um, are those STEMI equivalents or, or how does that fit into your decision making uh, when you determine to take somebody to the lab or not? Well, you know, part of it's the clinical service circumstances. Uh, if, if you've got the ST segments elevated, you know, I've, I've tended to always, and, and many people look at the uh, ABR as almost a, a symmetry uh, uh, lead uh, that's keeping the 12 lead a nice looking lead because you can get most of the information and in other leads. Uh, so uh, that one's always a tough, if it's an isolated ABR elevation, you're always scratching your head on that one. Uh, Wellens is going to be much more indicative of it's kind of those scrotal T waves across the board that probably in many cases indicative of significant embarrassment of the left main stem. And in those particular circumstances, uh, the the timing of intervention is is up for debate. Uh, if you don't have a STEMI, we've got obviously the door to balloon time. 
Uh, but when you have a non STEMI, the, the literature has been all over the place from uh, early on. There was an interesting study that a lot of cardiologists like to quote is that if you bring somebody a team in between the hours of uh, 1 a.m. and 5 a.m., that there are worse outcomes than uh, cooling that patient off until 5 o'clock in the morning when everybody's now awake because you're dealing with the team that's sleep deprived, et cetera. So cardiologists like to quote that one for the non STEMIs, non ST elevation. On the other hand, there's more data coming out now that more timely intervention in that population may salvage myocardium. And so there's getting to be a little shift backwards to a little bit earlier. Uh, and, and it's clinically dependent upon whether or not the patient's receiving adequate therapy. Uh, nothing we hate more than to get the phone call to him that says, look, some elevated. I don't have a STEMI. Uh, what should we do about it? And, and in those particular circumstances, it's, boy, we'd really like to see some nitrates on board, some heparin on board. You know, the heart rate is uh, 115. I'd like to see the heart rate at 90. And then if we're still having issues, that's when we come in to see, you know, come in to manage the patient. So there's plenty of room in the non STEMIs for inter introduction of medical therapy, as many of these, as I kind of alluded to, 650,000 a year are, are brand spanking new. Uh, it's their first encounter with this kind of a process. And there's an equal number, if not more, non STEMIs, you know, the N STEMIs, where the EKG. The other thing that's coming out, and it's interesting as I was looking for some of the literature on this, uh, there's a post out there that realistically we're, we are kind of missing the boat a little bit when we say STEMI is our indicator for occlusion. Uh, it is sometimes, uh, but the EKG misses a lot of patients who have an occlusive event that's silent or not manifest on it, uh, posterior. Typically, the ones that are most commonly missed, uh, upwards of 28% of the time, are circumflex coronary or circumflex marginal distributions are missed on the EKG because they don't have uh, ST segment elevation. So, realistically, what we're looking for is some methodology that allows us to say the vessel is occluded, open the damn thing. And uh, we, the EKG has been the closest we've had to that. I think what is coming about from the NSTEMI literature is that not all NSTEMIs are the same. Uh, and, and it's due to a shortcoming of the ability of the electrocardiogram to give us that classic ST lifting. So I think you're, you'll probably find that based upon clinical circumstance, and uh, clinical presentation and, and enzymes that are rising that those patients will likely go to the lab in a much more timely fashion than not. Wellens, where you're looking at a left main, those are ones you have to be real cautious about. Those are kind of you look and get the hell out of Dodge because left main disease, theoretically and, and technically, especially a young individual with diabetes, should be managed with surgery. Uh, they will have better out long term outcomes with an operation with a lima placed on that LED and either a radial or uh, another graph placed on the circumflex distribution much better than uh, a drive by shooting with a uh, uh, with a balloon or stent. Now, if they're crashing and burning, you, you don't have an option. OK, they, they need to have the vessel open. But if they've got Timmy two, three flow down that uh, Timmy three flow down that vessel, uh, they should be temporized. A balloon pump should be placed. And then they should be uh, operated. Thank you. The other question we had was in regards to left bundles and, and pace rhythms. Can you talk about the role of the modified Scarbosa criteria uh, in somebody with a pre existing bundle or pace rhythm? And then how the paradigm is somewhat shifting in regards to a new or a presumed new left bundle? Well, you know, that, that it, what, what year is it? Uh, that's where the, we are in the left bundle, basically. Um, you know, if you have discordant uh, ST segments in a left bundle, that's probably the, the, the strongest identifier for uh, a, an ischemic event, uh, where they're frankly discordant. I think the other part of that criteria is greater than five millimeters and, and two of the anterior precordial leads. Uh, that becomes a little bit tougher because many of these patients have left bundle with a left ventricular hypertrophy, which tends hypertrophy, which tends to create some issues there. A new left bundle is one where uh, you're going to look at and and if the clinical circumstances are consistent, they'll be taken to the laboratory. Uh, Thank you. 
because sometimes we see oh, a newly need to go to the lab and that's not the right answer. Uh, there's many causes for a left bundle branch block, one of which is an ischemic substrate. To have a left bundle created by an ischemic event, you really need to have a significant insult to the myocardium uh, because the left bundle branch uh, bifurcates early into a left anterior and a posterior fa fascicles. And in order to take out the whole system, you either have a very targeted septal infarct or you've taken out a, a very large piece of territory. So left bundles, I think, are really in the setting of, of uh, the clinical circumstances uh, that would drive them to the laboratory. Pacers, uh, you know, all bets are off with pacers, uh, especially if you've got somebody who's intermittently pacing. Uh, because intermittent pacing creates alternation of the T waves and ST segments that are very difficult to discern from an ischemic event. And if they're uh, a person who's got a pacemaker in, but when you look at them and they're not being paced and they've got these ugly looking ST and T waves, it may well have been because 40 minutes before you saw them, they were actually being paced. So pacing creates a problem in terms of, again, in terms of the ability to utilize the EKG. And I think that that's another circumstance where if you have to really rely on the clinical circumstances, uh, you know, you take a 57 year old male who's had diabetes and hypertension and uh, they uh, uh, are developing substernal chest pain or, or a syndrome, which is, remember, uh, one of my old professors, yeah, he's getting older now, that's a long time ago, uh, said that there is no uh, scenario that doesn't rule out the heart. Uh, you know, by nature, heart pain is atypical from what we would uh, describe. And in fact, the ACC is just uh, ACC with the American Heart Association has just published a guideline on the evaluation of patients with chest pain. And they explicitly stated that atypical is no longer to be used. It's either non cardiac or possibly related to cardiac. And, and that's probably a true statement because by its very nature, cardiac pain is atypical. Uh, remember, we got wired poorly to let us know when our organs are raising hell. You get 5,000 uh, nerve endings on your fingertips that'll tell you when you slam it in a car door that it's a Buick, that it is uh, a red Buick and it was a passenger door. On the other hand, your uh, heart can be attacking you and that person has 60 tums sitting in her belly uh, uh, that they've treated for the last three days. Uh, we just didn't get wired well for it. And until the patient has the experience and the direct association with an angiogram that shows that's your coronaries, uh, uh, it's very difficult for them to appreciate. And again, that's where it becomes a major issue for the 650,000 who are having their first events. Uh, you know. But on the same note, I, 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 I kind of ingested the guy who comes in with the inferior infarct with 60 tums in his belly. You know, there are people we take to the laboratory who need tums in their belly. Uh, because of the overlap, and it's it's sometimes very difficult to discern clinically uh, what's at issue here. Yeah, thank you very much. That was really insightful. Uh, I think those those were all the questions that we had come through. So, Dr. Van Fossen, want to thank you for your time and for the good information that you got out to our participants in the conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you.